civilization is traveling today on giant structures of iron and steel. Powering skyscrapers, railroads, huge bridges, storage reservoirs, agriculture, electrical power, great ships of iron and steel, giant airliners, and modern homes. Research has played a prominent part in the story of iron and steel. In the year 1902, Armco established the first research laboratory for the study of sheet metal. From that day to this, its contributions to metallurgy have been notable in meeting new problems and making better and still better iron and steel. Research is always a quest in the land of the great unknown. And new developments often start from such simple things as a chance conversation, the offering of new ideas, or the desire to find some better way to do things. This has been the experience of the Armco Research Laboratory. Increased production made possible by continuous sheet rolling created thousands of new and better jobs in the steel industry, as well as industries served by steel. The continuous mill is only one step in the manufacture of iron and steel sheets. Let's join these men as they go to work in a modern steel plant. We start with the iron ore and follow the interesting processes that convert it into metal for our daily use. Here's one of the ore boats of the Armco fleet nearing the end of her journey. She was loaded with ore at the head of the Great Lakes only a few days ago. Giant cranes scoop up the red dirt and dump it into railroad cars that carry it to the roaring blast furnaces. Hundreds of tons of iron ore are fed into the blast furnace every day. Incoming ore is quickly emptied into storage bins, a car load at a time. A great bucket bites off a ton or more of iron ore, and away it goes to fill the skip car. To the top of a hundred foot furnace goes the skip car, where the ore is added to layers of coke and limestone in the huge fiery cavern. The smelting process is on. Now they're tapping the furnace. Terrific heat is no name for it. Mighty blasts of roaring air forced into the furnace turn it into a gigantic blowtorch. That's why it's called a blast furnace. The metal is guided into a brick-lined ladle car. We call it a thermos bottle because it keeps the metal hot for many hours until the open hearth furnaces are ready for it. In the open hearth department, this agile machine charges in and out of the 150 ton furnaces, feeding limestone and choice metal tidbits of melting scrap. The furnace is ready for the rest of its charge, so we pour it from the big thermos bottle. This may appear like a raging storm on the Sahara Desert, but you're actually looking through the open furnace door at Armco ingot iron being refined of its impurity. Phew, no wonder the iron seethes and bubbles. The melter tells us it's 3,000 degrees inside there and getting hotter all the time. Melter takes a sample from the furnace and into the pneumatic tube it goes for a quick trip to the control laboratory. The 
chemist drills the test piece and the drillings are carefully weighed, then analyzed to get the exact percentage of impurities. It must measure up to a rigid Armco standard or the heat will be rejected. Frequent checks are made by the laboratory while the metal is being refined, but no heat is tapped until the laboratory gives the word. Complete control and laboratory checks are typical of production in every Armco mill. It's mighty exacting, this manufacture of special analysis metals. It requires a lot of skill, a lot of experience to produce steel that will do what the user wants it to do. This is the aim and the end of research. The laboratory discovery of today becomes the better steel of tomorrow. Okay, Bill, let her go. The order to tap the heat is flashed to the waiting men at the furnace. Let's get as close as we dare to the tap hole in the rear of the furnace where they are digging out the clay plug. Wow! 150 tons of molten fire is flowing out of that tap hole. While they are teaming that heat of ingot iron into molds, let's take a look at an electric furnace and the making of stainless steel. This is an altogether different process from making open hearth iron and steel and is used only in the manufacture of fine alloys. Stainless steel is that bright rustless metal that is finding so many new uses. Electric furnaces can be closely controlled and this is vital to the manufacture of stainless steel. Again, strict medical control. Every heat must measure up to the very highest standards before the laboratory gives it an okay. We have seen stainless steel start on its way. Now we're back in the open hearth department where we were a few minutes ago. Molten metal is flowing into the ingot molds. 12,000 pounds in each mold. When the ingot cools on the outside, a stripper crane lifts the mold. But don't be fooled. The inside of that block of iron may still be molten when it goes into the soaking pits. Soaking here means saturating the ingot in heat until the temperature is the same all the way through and just right for rolling. White hot and all ready for the first rolling operation. the conveyor to the blooming mill. Great rolls work down the glowing block of metal. Back and forth it goes, growing thinner and longer with each pass. Now up the conveyor for soaking in another inferno of heat. in this business of making steel.
A great shear bites off a chunk. Just as slick as cutting off a piece of butter. It's on its way to the continuous mill. There she goes, down the conveyor to the first stand of rolls. But we can't see so well here. So let's climb high up into the overhead crane and follow it right down the line. This revolutionary type of mill lifts one of the hardest jobs in the industry from the backs of men and puts it on smooth running machinery. That water spray on the hot iron knocks off the mill scale and helps to keep the surface smooth. Longer and thinner, faster and faster it moves from one stand of rolls to another. In between, edging rolls keep the edges smooth. On and on she goes, coming out the last stand faster than you can run. Think of it. Less than two minutes ago, that chunk of red hot steel six inches thick. Now it's as thin as a dime and 200 feet long. Into the coiler it finally lands and spins around a large spool at terrific speed. Coiling makes the metal easier to handle. Now we stop for a quick glance at the big coil storage warehouse. Thousands of coils of different grades of iron and steel are stored here to speed the handling of rush orders. But let's follow the coils on their regular route from the coiler to the big cold mill. An endless chain lifts the coils to the cold mill floor level. Three of them are quickly welded together and started through the continuous pickler. Yes, that's what it's called, a pickler. Here the steel is thoroughly clean. First a scrubbing in mild sulfuric acid, then a thorough wash and rinse in water. Here it is coming out of the pickler and forming into a huge coil again. Then down the conveyor on its way to the cold mill. Threading a needle has nothing on these boys threading the coil into the coal mill. These giant machines run as smoothly and quietly as a new sewing machine, but the pressure is terrific as they reduce the heavy cold steel down to thin strips. The rolls in each stand run a little faster than the preceding ones as a strip of steel goes through, getting longer and thinner all the time. Accuracy is vital here, and the operator watches his dials and gauges like a hawk. Uniform thickness is important, because this metal will be formed on dies into many intricate parts. Some manufacturers require steel cut to size. A flying shear is put to work and does the job rapidly and accurately. You know steel takes a hard beating on its journey through the big rolls and the tiny molecules become disarranged. We must get them back to normal and this is done by giving them a heat bath called annealing. The sheets are piled on a heavy base then a cover is lifted into place and carefully sealed before the heat is turned on. Time and temperature are both vitally important to proper annealing.
Electrical recording pyrometers bring temperatures by wire from several points inside each pile of sheets under the cover. Skilled metallurgists keep a constant check on these instruments. Out come the annealed sheets ready for temper rolling. Thousands of sheets can be annealed at one time in this great battery of ovens. Temper rolling adds three necessary qualities to sheets. Flatness, a nice even surface, and a proper degree of stiffness. As the sheets leave the last stand of temper rolls, they pass through a roller level that further improves their flatness. And believe it or not, for absolute flatness, the sheets are stretched. The tone of the sheet when struck by a wooden mallet tells the operator when the sheets are really flat. These dead flat sheets are necessary for some products, such as metal furniture, where the slightest waviness would mar the appearance of the finished product. A great many users need sheets of exact length or width, so they are re-squared on heavy shears like this. In the finishing section of the stainless steel department, the metal is polished to a high luster. Some of the stainless sheets are given a satin finish, while others are polished until they could serve as a mirror in Milady's boudoir. For many uses, sheet metal is coated with zinc to give it longer life, and that's called galvanizing. First, the sheets are thoroughly cleaned, then they pass slowly through a bath of molten zinc. A frost-like spangle forms as the zinc cools and crystallizes. Some galvanized products can be more easily and more economically made from coils, and these also come from Armco mills. Zinc is not the only coating for iron and steel sheets. An alloy of lead and tin provides a smooth surface for attractive finishes. Every grade of sheet metal we have seen made must pass under the eyes of a watchful inspector on its way to serve you. Under powerful lights, he scans the surface for imperfections. Only large users buy sheet metal from a steel plant, but all of us by many products made of sheet metal. Armco men work, live, and play in pleasant surroundings. The man who is proud of his home, his community, his company, and its products carries a spirit that is reflected in the work he does. And this is typical of enlightened American industry. Parks, playgrounds, swimming pools, baseball, tennis, Golf. These represent healthful recreation and play a wholesome part in the lives of American workers. And so in Armco's great plants in this country and overseas, there is a conscientious endeavor to promote a spirit of understanding, loyalty, and cooperation. Behind all you have seen in this romance of iron and steel is the leadership of understanding management. Appropriately, we introduce the founder of Armco, George M. Verity. Everything that Armco is and has done is the result of cooperation. A cooperation that embraces the mutual interests of employees, customers, stockholders, and management. Only as men can learn to live and work together in understanding and happiness can life bring to all of us its richest reward.